This is the key driving principle behind grade 10 chemistry, the, the first half of it. Why is it that atoms form bonds in the first place? What is their goal in doing so? Yeah? To what? Yeah, to become stable, exactly. And how is it that they become stable? They can lose electrons or gain electrons. Sure, that's one way of doing it. But what is the goal of losing electrons or gaining electrons? To become like the nearest noble gas. Uh, what do you mean by that? To become like their nearest noble gas, what do you mean by that? Yeah? To have the same amount of valence electrons. Yeah, to have the same amount of valence electrons. Noble gases, do they have a full shell of outer electrons? Yeah, they do, right? That's what makes them stable. As a result, they don't form bonds. Well, we can kind of force them to, but they don't really form bonds um, with other elements. All the other elements, they want to get a full valence shell because that will make them stable. And they do that by either losing electrons, gaining electrons, or sharing electrons. The sharing we'll talk about later on. Today, we're going to be focusing again on gaining electrons and losing electrons. So you may want to pull out a piece of paper right now. Today we are going to be talking about binary ionic compounds. Binary ionic compounds. What do you think that word binary means? Bi, what does bi mean? Binary. What's that? Two. Yeah, you're right, Gary. Yeah, it's two. Right? So, binary here, we're going to be talking about compounds consisting of two atoms. So, whenever you see that word binary, we're talking about two different elements here. Okay? I should actually rephrase that and say so two elements. Atoms will say uh, two uh, different elements. Now, looking on your periodic table, which elements will form positively charged ions, will form cat ions? Which groups, which families will form cations? Yep, yeah, Victoria? The alkali metals is one group for sure, right? They have one electron, they want to lose that electron and get a full shell. They'll become positive. What else? Yep? Yeah, your alkaline earth metals. Um, what else? What about, uh, say, aluminum? What does aluminum want to do? How many valence electrons does aluminum have? How many? Three. So what does it want to do? Lose three or gain five? It wants to lose three. So your cations, would you say that they are metals? Yes. Right? So when we're talking about binary ionic compounds, um, this is going to be um, between a metal, which is going to be your cation, and a non-metal. And this is going to be your anion. Right? Because if we look at our non-metals, do they typically form negatively charged ions? They do, right? If you look at the halogens, what charge do they take on when they form an ionic bond? They have seven valence electrons, so what charge would they take on when they form an ionic bond? Negative one, right? They want to gain one negative, one electron, so negative one. What about oxygen and sulfur? 
negative 2, right? They have six valence electrons. They want to gain two negatives. What about uh, nitrogen phosphorus? Negative 3. You get the idea, right? So when we're talking about binary ionic compounds, this is going to be the ionic bond between a metal and a non-metal. That's how you can identify that you have a binary ionic compound. So, let's start with some uh, naming today. Because some of you may have been a little confused on your worksheets. Because instead of saying fluorine, for example, it would say fluoride. Huh. Why is that? That has to do with the way we name ions, which for some of you are going to really like this because it is quite simple. So we're going to start today talking about going from the chemical formula of our ionic compound to its name. In chemistry, we need a common language when talking about all the compounds. Um, so we are going to be learning a lot of naming rules in this unit. So we're going to start today going from chemical formula to name. Now, step one here. Actually, this is fairly simple. We're not going to break this down into steps. Uh, so when naming... List the cation first. And most of the time you don't really need to think about this because when you write your chemical formulas, you will always write the cation first. Right? When I was writing out table salt, how did I write it? Did I write it NaCl or ClNa? NaCl, right? The cation always comes first. So list the cation first. And do not change its name. Do not change its name. Huh. It looks really weird right that all caps. Now, the anion, however, we do change his name. What did you notice on your worksheets? If you did the loose dot worksheet, you should have noticed something in regards to the anions. When we're talking about the halogens or the calcogens. How did you notice the ending change? Yeah? They put I every time. They put I every time. So when you are listing your anion, you will add the suffix i. Suffix just means you're adding to that ending of your word. So, uh, when naming list the cation first and do not change the name, list the anion second and add the suffix I, I D E, I. So let's go through a couple examples together. Someone give me a metal and a non metal. Someone give me a metal. I'm going to pick on random people here. Give me a metal. Um, magnesium. Sure, magnesium. Give me a non-metal, someone. Kenny, give me a non-metal. Um, chlorine. Chlorine, sure. So, when I'm naming this, what was our first step here? What do we do to the cation? Nothing. You do nothing, right? We just list the name of our cation. So we have magnesium. We have magnesium. And then what do we do to our anion, to chlorine here? 
Yeah? Chloride. Now, learning how to add the suffix, um, that'll just come with practice, because some of them are non-intuitive. For example, if I gave you something like, like this. So I want to take a stab at naming that one. Well, what's the cation, first of all? Aluminum. Aluminum. We do not change its name. And then, what is the anion here? It's iodine. <clears throat> How do we add the suffix, though? What do you think it will become? This will come with practice. It's a little non-intuitive. It's aluminum iodide. So since there are so few non-metals, you'll just kind of get used to um, adding the suffixes as long as you do enough practice. So what's another one? So it's not iodinide, it's iodide. Another good example would be something like, uh, let's say, B-E-O. What's B-E-O? What's the B-E part? Beryllium? Well, I shouldn't pick beryllium, now I have to spell it. <laughs> it is two L's, okay. Beryllium and O? Ah, excellent. Oxide. A lot of students, when they first learn this, they'll try to put oxinide or something like that. Um, it is just oxide. So you will get used to those suffixes. You know, it's fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide. Oxide, sulfide, selenide, uh, nitride, phosphide. And those are the ones we're going to be using this semester. Okay. So now comes for the, the meat and potatoes today, the hard part. Um, going from name to chemical formula. This is where students struggle. Naming's pretty easy. Naming's pretty easy. So when we're going instead from name to chemical formula, what did I say about ionic compounds? Do the charges always need to balance out? Oh, that's an easy question. It's a yes or no question. Do the charges need to balance out? What do you think? Yeah. Yes, there we go, yes. So they do need to always balance out. Now, we learned over the past couple of classes uh, how ions are formed. We showed that, we modeled that using Bohr diagrams, and then we modeled that using Lewis dot diagrams. And today we're going to learn a system of doing it mathematically. Now, if you're completely bewildered by what I'm doing today, you need to move back a step. Right? If you don't understand how to come up with the chemical formulas, um, with the, the mathematical way I'm going to show you, you need to do it conceptually again with loose dots. If that doesn't make sense to you, you need to go back and draw some Bohr diagrams. Okay? Very important you have that fundamental base and know how to do it with modeling before you move on to the next step. So how do we go from name to chemical formula? What's the system I want you to use? Um, it's pretty straightforward. So we're going to do this through an example. So let's do, um, let's do one that was really annoying to draw out. Something like aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide. Now when I drew this one out for you guys, uh, there was a lot of board diagrams for this one. It's kind of annoying because the charges don't work out very well. Uh, you got to add a bunch of oxygens and a couple aluminums. Let's figure out an easier way than doing it with modeling. So first, uh, there's a couple questions I want you to ask. The first question is, when they form an ionic bond, what charge will they have? So step one. No, I'm going to draw steps. Here's step one. 
determine the charges on your ions. So determine the charges on uh, your ions. So what charge will aluminum have when it makes an ionic bond? You always got to think, well, how many valence electrons does it have? Three. So then, what will the charge be? Positive. Excellent. Positive what? Positive one. Not positive one. It has three valence, so does it want to lose three electrons or gain five? It wants to lose three. And if it loses three electrons, right, here's aluminum right here. If it loses three electrons, one, two, and three, so it looks like neon now, it has three less negatives, but the protons haven't changed. So what's the charge? Ah, there we go, three plus. So we have Al3 plus. What about oxygen? Yep. Not negative three, no? Negative two. Negative two, there we go. Right, it has six valence electrons. Therefore, you need to add two electrons to give it a full shell. Right, it'll look like which noble gas when you do that? Yeah, right? One, two to look like neon. And now you have a couple important questions to ask. Um, this is going to seem a little strange, but this is an important step to doing transition metals. The transition metals are kind of what we're building towards. They're really tough for students to understand. So it is important that we get this mathematical way down now. You are going to uh, determine the total number, the total number of electrons donated and received by using the LCM of your ionic charges. Who here remembers what LCM means? Yeah, that is your lowest common multiple. So if you didn't know what that means, probably should write the whole word, word, right? That is your lowest common multiple. What is LCM for all you math wizards out there? I know you know it. So the lowest common multiple is the lowest multiple that both of your numbers share. So for example, let's say I gave you the numbers 3 and 5, okay? So what is the lowest number that both of those are multiples of? Yeah, excellent, 15. Now all you have to do is you have to ask, okay, well, what are the multiples of 3? That's 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. What are the multiples of 5? Well, that's 5, 10, 15. Oh, look, that is the lowest multiple that both of these numbers share. Right? You should have done that in earlier. Any questions about that? We're going to be working with really simple multiples, though, because our charges never really get that big. Okay? So, really, really simple multiples here. What is the LCM between 2 and 3? What is the lowest common multiple between 2 and 3? Yep. Six. Yeah, it's 6, right? So in total, there will be 6 electrons donated. And in total, there will be 6 electrons received. That is the total charge uh, of your cations and the total charge of your anions. Okay, so this is your total charge.
Step three. You will determine how many of each ion you need in order um, to meet the number of electrons donated slash received. I like to use this language because I find it helps students understand these concepts if we're talking about the donating of electrons and receiving of electrons. But the reality is we're really talking about the total charges here. The total charges are what have to balance out. So right, this really is representative of the total charge. Good morning. So then how many of each of our ions do we need? How many of each of our ions do we need here? So if in total, we need six electrons to be donated, yet aluminum here will only donate three per aluminum atom. How many aluminums do we need? Yeah, you're right, what is it? Two. Yeah, we need two, right? In order to donate a total of six electrons, we need two aluminums. How many oxygens do we need? We're gonna need three oxygens. Everyone see that? So in total, we need to receive those six electrons. And if each oxygen will only receive two, we're going to need three in total to receive all six. Yep? Well, can we do the crossover rule? Um, you can. However, the crossover rule will let you down uh, in several ways. The main way is that when we talk about transition metals and how to name transition metals, it is much easier to think of it in terms of electrons donated and received. The crossover rule eliminates from your mind having to think about um, the number of electrons, thinking about valence, thinking about charge. It makes it much simpler, but you lose out on a lot of that foundational knowledge. If you can master doing it this way, you'll always be better off than the crossover rule. Um, I don't really teach the crossover rule uh, unless I have to as like a survival strategy if a student's completely not getting it. Highly recommend you don't use that method. All right, let's do another example. Let's do another example. So these are the key questions you're going to ask yourself. One, what are the charges on my ion? Two, what is the total number of electrons donated and received? That's representative of my lowest common multiple. And three, how many of each of my ions do I need to donate that many electrons and receive that many electrons? And lastly, let's actually write down our chemical formula here. Um, what is it? What is it? How many aluminums do I need? Two. So that's A, L, two. How many oxygens? Three. Three oxygens. So that is the chemical formula for this binary ionic compound. Uh, that's the chemical formula for this binary ionic compound. Let's do another example. Let's do, hmm, let's see. Let's do sodium nitride. Let's do sodium nitride. So what is step one? What do we need to figure out? The charge. 
So what is the charge on sodium when it forms an ionic bond? What does it want to do? It wants to lose one, so what will this charge be? Not negative one, plus one. That's the most common mistake I see, by the way. Remember, what are we losing? We're losing negatives. You have to think back to grade 9 electricity. If we're losing negatives, our number of positives never changes, right? The number of protons never changes. Therefore, if we lose a negative, our atom will be positive. What will be the charge on nitrogen? Ah, three negative. Excellent. All right, we are going to be gaining three electrons because we have five valence. We want to gain one, two, three to look like neon. What is my second step? Right, we got to figure out the total number of electrons donated and received, which is the LCN. So how many electrons have we donated and received here? What is the lowest common multiple between oops, 1 and 3? Yeah, it's 3. So in total, we are going to be donating 3 electrons. And in total, we are going to be receiving 3 electrons. What is the last step, the last question you have to ask? Yeah, you have to figure out how many of each ion you need. So, if we have to donate three electrons, how many sodium atoms am I going to need to donate those three? Yeah, you're going to need three because each one is only going to donate one electron. How many nitrogens am I going to need? One, excellent. Right? If one nitrogen will receive three electrons, and we only need to receive three electrons, well, the answer is one. So what is our compound going to be? What is our compound going to be? So not sodium-3. Yeah, there you go. Na3 and one. Now, what did I say about ones in chemistry? We don't write them down. Yeah, chemistry lazy. We don't write down ones. So whenever you see a blank space beside an atom, that means one. All right, let's do one more example, then I'm going to let you work here. Um, let's do, uh, let's say, Calcium oxide. Calcium oxide. Let's go through those three steps again. Step one. What do we need to do? Find the, charge. Find the charges on our ions. What charge will calcium have? No, no, no. So what is it? Two positive. Two positive. Right? So calcium is right here. How many valence electrons does calcium have? Three. Two. So it's going to lose one. Two electrons to look like argon. So that's going to be Ca2+. Plus. And oxygen? Negative. Yeah, we've already done it, right? Uh, two negative. What is the total number of electrons donated and received here? What is the lowest common multiple? Two. <laughs> it's two, right? The lowest common multiple between two is two. Um, so it's going to be two donated and two received. And as a result, how many of each ion will we need in our bond? Yep. One of each. One calcium, one oxygen. Is everyone in agreement? Excellent. We're going to need one calcium because we're only donating two and calcium will donate two. And we need only one oxygen because we're receiving two electrons and oxygen can receive two. So what is our formula going to be for our compound? Just CaO. Just CaO. So it's going to be calcium 
oxide, just like that. Okay, I know that this method here may be a little tedious, but trust me, with enough practice, you'll be able to do these in your head. 